Hey, hey everybody. Coming in hot with a leap tonight and we're gonna talk side hustles. So super excited to get started here and start talking to our guests, hearing your story. Um, and we might even do a little sneak peek of some new product releases at the end if you're lucky. Um, so a couple of folks are trickling in here. Um, we're gonna get started in just a minute. So we'll just give a second uh, to get up on stage and get all set up. Um, all right. Let's get her up on stage. Maybe. <laughs> See if this will work. Um, for y'all who are just trickling in, uh, this is the leap. Oh, there we go. Hi, Rachel. Hey. How are How you? you doing? Good. Good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Of course. Oh man, I don't know. I'm actually holding my phone right now. <laughs> oh, no worries. Go for it. I just got this like thing that holds my phone, but my phone's like too heavy for it now. So anyway, if I start like slowly drooping, okay, don't be alarmed. <laughs> don't be alarmed. Everyone has like a we'll, we'll play it cool. face. Yeah. No, no. Um, I'm super excited to chat today. Uh, I'm just gonna do a quick little intro and then um, we'll get right into it. Uh, so for folks who are just uh, trickling in here, um, I'm Rachel Rennick. I am the co-founder and CEO of Wethos, uh, which is a platform that is built to help freelancers um, form what we're calling virtual studios. So it makes it really easy to price complex projects and split payments. Um, every week, I interview a different creative entrepreneur about their journey to freelance and taking the leap. Um, and this week's guest is an amazing uh, freelance business owner, which side hustler, actually. Uh, which I think is is uh, something that we're not we don't talk a ton about, but we have a lot of users on our platform who are who are side hustlers. Um, so Melissa Yap um, is an LA-based writer. Uh, she has 16 years of experience across marketing, content strategy, and content marketing. Um, originally born in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and she has I think I'm reading this right. Tra traipsed is that right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm like <laughs> I'm like I'm gonna speed that up, but it's good. Is that used um, in the US? I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've like heard I've heard of it but I was like am I saying that right <laughs> so yeah no over here um traipse the globe I love it now it's like a new word in my vocabulary for sure um anyway through London and New York City uh and is now leading for a technology platform um MNTN is that an acronym yeah. mountain yeah it's called mountain. mountain okay cool um in her spare time, uh, she's taking on freelance on the side. Um, lots of technology, lifestyle brands, doing copy, strategy, um, and has been featured uh, in her writing, really, in Fortune, um, Huffington Post, CNN, Bloomberg, all over the place. Super excited to chat today. Um, would love to know, just in your own words, like, tell us a little bit more about your journey to starting your, your side business and how it's evolved over time. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me on here, Rachel. Uh, it's been really, I'm glad we were able to chat and I can see a few of my friends have joined this chat, which is nice to see them. Hey guys, if, if you're there still. Um, <laughs> thanks so, for joining. So to tell you a little bit just about kind of where I've come from, um, I've kind of always been doing freelance. Uh, I've always had a love for writing. And so when I started my career in marketing, I just, I would usually just like pitch to different publications back home in Melbourne where I'm from. Um, usually in like the lifestyle, um, food, fashion uh, arena. And it's kind of, that's how it got started. So I would kind of just chip, like contribute to these publications. I would usually write for free. Um, and then over time they would come, come to me with more, if, if I wanted to contribute more, they kind of asked me to like open invite if I wanted to write a little bit more. So I usually did that. And then while I was working full time, and so I was kind of doing that just inter intermittently. Um, it, it kind of really took off when I moved to the US. So I moved to the US in 2013, uh, moved to New York. I was there for six years and then I moved to LA. Um, in New York, I kind of continued that uh, writing for a publication called Melting Butter. Actually, it was owned by a friend of mine who's, uh, she started her own PI agency now, but um, I was kind of their food writer. So she would, she would actually come to me with like different pitches and I would, go and taste test some food and then write about it. Um, and that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, so that was a lot of fun. And then I think it when it really took off was during the pandemic. Um, I hate to say it, but like 2020 was actually a very good year for me business wise. Yeah. Um, just because, uh, you know, I was working full time, but I was also getting a lot of demand for like from clients um, for freelance writers. So it really took off in 2020. And then since then, I've been kind of just you know, taking on projects um, here and there. Um, 
like base more more like tech clients in the b2b space mm. um like yeah i've just kind of felt like i've been naturally attracting those type of clients um based on the work i do work i do full time awesome yeah i feel like copywriting is such an interesting thing to freelance with because yeah. i feel like a lot there's a lot of opportunity i think um at least in our experience in uh, creating teams and copywriting being such a core part of that. Um, mm -hmm. If you're teaming up with other freelancers, like being able to fill that gap and then being able to balance out skills with other people is super interesting. It's just, it's just like a specific skill set. I think that lends itself really well to that kind of collaboration. Um, I would say out of like above maybe all else. Yeah. Um, I am curious, like, so I saw the copy on your website, which I really loved, which was your one-stop copy studio. Um, as a writer, I'm curious, like, what are the most common things that clients are coming to you for uh, in terms of, like, packages or services that they're looking for? I, I that's a really good question. It's honestly a bit of a mixed bag for me. Um, I was, before, kind of in 2020, I was focusing a little bit more on the long-form writing thing. So, a lot of clients would come to me and I've noticed this a lot with freelance in general. There's a lot of need for like uh, long form writers, like writing blog posts, white papers, just because of the time that it takes to do that. Um, yeah. It's a huge time saver for companies. And I think that's why they, they, I see so many of those postings online for those. So a lot of that was like blog posts and a lot, and I was focusing more on the, on the executional side of things. Um, it kind of so varies from blog posts to even like social media captions mm -hmm. and then website copy is a big one as well um, and white papers um, sometimes I also get you know requests from clients where they want to create a lot of things but they don't have the strategy in place and it's quite clear like from the discovery sessions that they still have some work to do on their end <laughs> um, so usually it's an educational process with the client um, when they come to me with those type of asks um, yeah yeah, we always found that a lot of times, like, people will come, would come to us when we were running our own, like, freelance business, uh, thinking that they knew what they needed, but then when you actually, like, got into it, you were like, wait, I don't think that's actually, like, we need to start here, or we need to readjust the scope in this way, because, like, maybe you need something different than what you initially thought, and so much of that is, is coaching, and I, I'm curious, too, like, on that first phone call when you, that you're doing with your clients, with your leads, yeah. um, how do you help your clients understand their own copywriting needs or like kind of navigate through that discovery process to kind of get a better sense of what's really going on underneath? Yeah, I, I usually have an um, introductory or discovery call with the client. So usually that before that call even happens, I'll have a kind of a, a questions, a list of maybe about five or so questions, which just ask them open-ended questions about their brand. So what are their copy needs? why did you reach out to me and what do you like about my work versus other freelancers or companies that you've chosen? Um, mm. I think that gets them to think about what they're actually looking for. Um, I'll ask them about what is it about your copy that you're looking to change and why? Um, things like deliverables, budget, timeline, that's really important to establish off the bat. Uh, and if it sounds like a good idea, if I can, it, from the answers I kind of know, whether or not the client is kind of ready or whether or not it makes sense to take another call with them. Um, but I use, and I think a lot of freelancers do this. It's like a vetting process um, to make sure that, that it's a good fit for both parties. Yeah. And it's funny, like I hear that so often from freelance, the freelance side of this. And I feel like still though, clients don't really quite understand that, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of funny because behind the scenes, we're all like, uh, like, uh, you know, I got a weird, uh, like, red flag from that, or, um, yeah. you know, I'm not sure if that's going to be a good fit, and then you got to yeah. navigate, like, how to say no, and it's just interesting, I think, how few people really know that that's going on in the background. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, I want to, I do want to talk about pricing, because, you know, obviously, on our platform, this is a huge part of it. When we first launched the, the software, we published all of our own pricing data. That's how the database like got started. Um, and then as more people were using it, we have now had like tens of thousands of people who are, who we have like feedback loops on all that, uh, all those price points. Mm -hmm. But, you know, copywriting, I think, <laughs> I remember building out the first version of our database with my co-founder, Claire, in a spreadsheet, um, as most software starts as a, in a spreadsheet. And I remember getting to a big chunk of services around copywriting and like thinking about, you know, per word, 
per page, <laughs> per project, like trying to figure out, you know, what is the right sort of mechanism. And I know these, there's a lot of conversation around uh, charging per word and how unfair that can be, um, especially when people are charging anywhere. I've seen ranges from like five cents a word to like a dollar a word. Oh. Um, so I'm curious, like, what's your perspective on pricing your services? You know, has your sort of perspective evolved around when you started versus like where you're at now? Um, and any tips for folks, particularly for the copywriters trying to figure out how to gauge that client's willingness to, you know, pay, pay fairly? <laughs> yeah, that, that's been honestly an ongoing challenge for me, even now, I think. And you're so right, because there's so many different ways to price based, you know, value based pricing, hourly pricing, or like, like you were saying, word pricing. And so at the very beginning, when I started, I, I can really remember it when I first wrote for this publication back home in Australia, um, they would pay me like $25 for the whole thing. So, and back then I thought that was actually like a lot of money, um, but they'd, they'd pay a flat rate. So that would include me doing, you know, researching the place and, and doing, mm. conducting interviews. Um, but I was like, wow, I'm getting paid for this. Like, this is so cool. That's like maybe over 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago when I first started, um, and then as my freelance, um, I guess my freelance career kind of continued on, I would then start to charge, honestly, hourly. Um, I wasn't even sure if that was the right way to do it. And I thought event at the start I was overcharging, but then I was, you know, also using a lot of like resources, like going on like Google and searching how much should, a, how much should you charge um, for your copywriting services and then just... <laughs> Basically, basically making an estimate based on my years of experience and just like coming up with an hourly number. Um, and then pandemic happened um, in 2020 and I was getting a lot of requests and I was just noticing that the pricing that I was giving, everyone was like saying, yeah, that's fine. And then there's this um, Facebook group that I join uh, called, I think, Freelancing, uh, Freelancing Females. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you've heard of it, but I, that was mm -hmm. a huge resource to me um, when I first, when, I, when it really kicked off. And a lot of people were saying, um, if, if a client, if you're getting a lot of clients saying yes, then your pricing is probably too low. And that, that has really stuck with me um, a lot with my pricing now. Um, and I would just usually just take on anything and everything just because, you know, it paid, but then I, I got burnt out by that. So I have learned to quality over quantity and just um, accepting the clients that I think are a good fit for me and vice versa. So I don't know if you want me to give you, I guess, some ranges that I've quoted clients, but um, the most recent project that I did with a, um, a tech, like a startup client. So they wanted me to create messaging frameworks for them and then a like website copy for maybe I think four pages, five pages. Um, I think was, that was 15,000. So, and you know, back then that, yeah. I, would have, I would have freaked out about charging that, but I know like, you know, obviously over time you accumulate the skills. I work full time as well and I work in that space. So I feel like, you know, the right clients will pay. Um, so I don't think it's a bad thing to like, you know, be charging, to be charging premium. I think if anything, I think it weeds out the clients that are not right for you. Um, so yeah. that's definitely a tip that I have. Um, and then, yeah, the one where I was mentioning, if you're pricing, if everyone's saying yes to your pricing, then it's probably not, it's probably too low. <laughs> so, um, yeah. and always, another thing that I do is also increasing, you know, my rates yearly, because I think mm -hmm. of it like working full time, you accumulate skills you get more experience. So you should be charging more for that. Um, and I think, I feel like value-based pricing is definitely the way to go for copywriting. Definitely not per word or per hour, because I think per hour or like time-based pricing, you actually penalize yourself because if you're more efficient, you're not getting, you're, you're getting paid less by being, yeah. but by, by, by being more efficient. So I steer away from those types of um, clients who, who ask about like, how much do you charge per word? Because then I know automatically off the bat, they're not, they're not the right fit. Um, and I think value-based pricing is good because you can talk about what the client's going to get for that, for that amount. And it's like a flat fee. You don't pay any more. Obviously if there's scope creep, then yes, there's extra charges, but then both parties know what they're getting. So it's just a little bit more clean in my opinion. Yeah. The sort of expectation versus reality. Um, yeah. That's to me, like that's the hardest part about, a service-based business, especially when you're doing sales, because you're selling something that hasn't happened yet. 
So mm -hmm. like you, there's this like built in need to, to build trust with the client um, up front because you're sort of promising this thing that hasn't happened yet. And then sometimes, in fact, a lot of times what actually happens <laughs> doesn't exactly go the way that you, what you thought would happen. And so sometimes you have to build differently than what you'd originally sort of estimated. And then that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm curious, like um, when you're raising your rates, uh, is there anything like, how do you explain that to your maybe existing clients? Um, or do you do that for just net new people that come on? Like, how do you sort of handle that? I've done, it for, I've done it for existing clients and usually they don't have a problem with it. Like I'll raise it usually between 10 to 20% a year. Nice. Hell yeah. Um, and then the ones who are like, Oh, that's if they try to like bargain with me for the pricing, then that's, that's like a red flag to me. And I have made that mistake a few times in my previous, like, you know, just you get, you learn as you go, but like I've had clients with who have tried to negotiate the rates and, you know, I should have known at the time that it's probably shouldn't, I shouldn't have taken the project on, but those are clients usually end up being the ones that um, are not so easy to work with. So, yeah, yeah I, yeah. Uh, I think that's, uh, that can cost you money in and of itself, right? Yeah. Like getting onboarding a client that's, that's tough to work with or it doesn't, is it fitting within your value set? I really appreciate, by the way, you sharing like an actual number. Um, that's so powerful for people to just understand and know. And that's yeah. one of the, you know, big things about why we're talking about this all the time is because uh, what I, the way I see it is like, when you look at the data on the market, like 95% of freelancers aren't breaking six figures and half the workforce is going to be freelance by 2030. And those are not like viable and lucrative careers to support your family on. Like you, six figures doesn't mean what it used to, you know? And so- yeah. I feel like there has to be this like kind of collective like revolution of being like, no, no, no. Like we're, we're not charging $5 anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not going to fly. I was going to say though, Rachel, like I, the Wethos is the big, is the tool that I was using to price because I wasn't sure how to price myself. Um, and it honestly gave me the confidence to charge what I'm charging now. So yeah, it's like kudos to you guys and building that tool out, the pricing tool. That's been super yeah, for me. thank you. I appreciate that. I, we hear th that word confidence. We hear that, like, that's like the number one word we hear from people um, and what that data does. And I think that says it all to me because it's like, it's not like we taught anyone anything necessarily. We just said like, hey, here's data and information, like knowledge is power in that regard of like how other people are charging. And, you know, it's up to anybody to get that scope sold and over the finish line. Um, yeah. But I think- it's been it's been really awesome to just hear the impacts of that because uh confidence is everything and i think having the ability to to feel like oh this is actually backed up by something um can definitely really help with that so i appreciate that yeah. um so okay i do want to talk about like copywriting and strategy and content strategy and how closely related those things are arguably hard to thread them apart if you wanted to um how do you think about those two skill sets with your clients and like how much of your day-to-day -day work do you find to be pure I guess, writing with a strategy that it maybe exists versus coming up with a strategy and then executing on that in writing? Um, well, I'd say my full-time job is more execution because the strategy has always has already been set. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to freelance, it's a little bit of a mixed bag um, because you have clients, like I was mentioning at the start of our call, that they say that they want these things, but they don't actually know what their brand stands for or like they don't have a defined tone of voice built out and I remember I had a call with a client actually they, they were a tech client as well but they wanted me to they want they, they asked us to like do a lot of they wanted um, a website they wanted some blog posts and some social media copy but they didn't have the foundational set so I actually when I had that call with them I was like yeah you guys I, like at the moment there's not I can't work with this because at the moment you you don't really know what I didn't, I said it in a more tactful way, but um, <laughs> I think there's some work to do on your Not end a good about, fit at this time. <laughs> yeah, but understanding what your brand is before I can actually write a whole website about it. Like, what are your value props? What's your messaging strategy? And they didn't have any of that built out. So I think that kind of gave them the, they realized then that they had some work to do behind the scenes. But I think generally for me, from my experience, it's been a bit of both. So I've had asks about like, can you write some blog posts and, um, they have their, you know, they have their strategy set out so they know who they are. Um, but again, I'm like not working on more longer form strategy, longer form pieces anymore. I'm trying to focus more on the content strategy piece. 
Uh, and then there's clients that, um, you know, obviously want all of the, all of it. And I find it very hard to like piecemeal this type of thing. And I had an experience last year with a client where they kind of almost tried to piecemeal it and it just doesn't work. Like from that experience, I know that from like with future clients that I want to work with, it's either like you go all in, but not, it's not, it shouldn't be fragmented. Like it shouldn't be like, oh, we want you to like write some taglines here and then maybe write a little bit of this. You don't mm. really understand the full scope of what you're working with if you're just doing it like fragmented like that. Um, so I remember that was a bit of a, that wasn't a learning curve for me because I would have probably shouldn't have taken that on because knowing that it was going to be like that, um, I would rather go all in and have, tell the client, okay, um, I think you need this content strategy set up as well as X, Y, Z blog posts, white papers. I can help you with some social media cap uh, captions, but that's all like all in one. I don't do piecemeal. And I really don't think that works in the copy space because everything is linked to that foundational core. Um, doing a little bit of each of little things just for the client to save money really doesn't not save them money in the long run. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. We call that like a, a band-aid over a bullet hole, basically, yeah. which is, you know, it'll work yeah. kind of for now, but it, it you're not going to actually come out the other side of that with I, a, a good like set of values or learnings from like what people are actually looking for and like why they care yeah. about it. And I'm wondering like when, you, have you, when you've encountered a client who's sort of like resistant to doing a larger strategic initiative, maybe in their mind, like what, what have been the blockers in their minds or like, are they thinking like, Oh, this is good. That's going to take too long or it's not, they don't see the value in it. Or have you sort of, uh, can you help us understand a little bit about, I don't know, the sort of mindset that somebody is in when they're not understanding. I think honestly, it's a little bit of the budget. And they just don't see the value in it. Like, I remember someone saying, oh, it shouldn't take you this long to do. And that, like, that's a little bit, <laughs> when they say things like that, you can tell that they don't, they really don't see the value in it. Like, oh, it should take you an hour to write a tagline. But obviously a tagline is worth, you know, if it's published and it actually drives like business, then it's worth a lot more. So I, it's, it's an ongoing education. And I'm pretty sure that's like with a lot of freelancers, educating clients about that. Um, yeah, that, yeah, I think honestly, it's just like budget, budget wise, they don't have the budget and they try to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they want to save money by just drawing you in when they need it for the little things. But then yeah. in the long run, like I was saying, it's gonna, it's gonna like, pay, they're gonna pay for that in the long run by not, yeah. I feel like not working with someone from the get go and just having them included in the process, process from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, want to switch gears a little bit and just hear a little bit more. So you're doing, you're running your freelance business on the side. You work in-house at a, like a software tech company. And I believe you've been also in the agency world as well. Like, can you tell us a little bit about how those different experiences uh, or how those experiences sort of differ from one another? Um, and like, you know, if anything surprised you about running your own business that maybe you didn't realize you had in some of those other roles or didn't have? Yeah. Um, so I started my first job in New York was at an agency and I had never worked in agency before. I've always been client side and I really did not know what I was in for, to be honest. Um, I think after that experience, I wanted to move back in house. It was very fast paced, um, working with multiple clients, which I'm not used to because I usually just work on the one as being in house. Um, and you know, for me, it was a bit of a culture shock to moving from Australia to the U S especially to New York. I, I just had no idea that the work culture was like that. And I was, I was honestly thrown in the deep end. I won't lie. Like it was a struggle for me. So after new, after the agency, I decided to go back in house. And I think that's the best place for me. I just, it's a better pace. I feel like you understand a brand. You get to work on one brand. You understand that brand better. Um, personally for me, it's, I feel like it's a less pressure. Um, than you know servicing a client where you need to be there like whenever the, at the beck of call really um so i found that's a big two differences that i noticed and then in terms of like running my own business um for me it's honestly the administrative part of it yeah um, keep, brutal yeah keeping track of the receipts um which I don't have a very sophisticated system of doing right now. I just email myself receipts and put it in a tax return folder. 
that tax I'll just <laughs> that <say>. works <laughs> yeah tax is a big one for me um like I didn't even like my I didn't even know you had to pay this is yeah like at the beginning I didn't even know that you had to pay quarterly taxes <laughs> when I was really starting yeah oh um, yeah the tax part of it um and then also like obviously like billing billing the client and like what to do if they pay late and enforcing those boundaries with the client um mm -hmm. if they pay late um co contracts as well i think has been a really big one for me like i feel like i've iterated on my contracts a few times and just gotten information from here and there like i never went to us like an attorney or a, a lawyer to help me create my contract i just use resources from the different freelancing groups that i join um and making sure i'm protected um from from you know because it's obviously a business transaction so yeah yeah that that's definitely one yeah i think the lack of like like financial and operational infrastructure yeah. is just brutal because yeah like they're you're you're it <laughs> and so like how do you you know track down that invoice or get somebody to pay on time etc we actually Fun fact, we used to have um, a fake email address that was frank at wethos.co. And if you didn't pay your invoice on time, <laughs> Frank was coming for you. And oh, it was literally just one of us. <laughs> but people, people respond to Frank. People don't really like to respond to Rachel or don't, don't really like to respond to Claire, but they, they will respond to Frank. Oh, really? um, so like, just like little things like that found, we found that like helped to just I don't know, make it feel a bit more established and also helped us with some of those power dynamics, honestly, that when you're independent um, can be really tough to, to manage because you just don't have a ton of leverage as one person. Yeah. Um, so last question as we're wrapping up here, um, a lot of folks might be taking the leap right now into freelance, maybe by choice, maybe not by choice. A lot of layups going on. Um, any advice for people who are looking to take the leap? Yeah, I think honestly, just do it. Um... I have personally found for me as a tool, LinkedIn, very useful for, for landing clients. Um, you've got to use their search function, but there are specific hacks that you can use with their search function to actually like keywords that you use that you're looking for. You know, I would search like freelance copywriter and see the most recent ones posted in the day and actually call, like reach out to them. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a little hack of mine. I found that I've actually landed clients that way um, by going down that, that route. Um, I mean, I, I do the best clients that I've gotten are through word of mouth, but if you're starting out, I think LinkedIn is a huge tool to leverage. Like that's probably been my biggest tool. Um, and also Slack groups. Um, you know, I've joined Wethos's group. There's another one that I join, uh, freelance founders. I think, I think I see you guys like follow each other freelance founders. So that's, yeah, we're close to them. that's, yeah, that's been really, that's a, that's a membership based one, but I've also, I've used that and, you know, I've landed jobs and I've actually helped people land jobs through that. Um, it's a great network. And yeah, I just think obviously connecting with a lot more, like with freelancers in the field, in the field that you're working in and getting, and just like having a coffee or just pinging them for advice is always a good start. But I think leveraging those platforms and also like not, not like understanding your worth um, and what you can bring to this table is key. Um, because if you don't, then people will, clients will walk all over you. So that's probably the number one, just understanding your value and, and not being afraid to say no, if something doesn't suit, if something's not the right fit, because something yeah. better will always come along. Yeah, I love that. That's such an important piece to this um, whole thing, because if you're running uh, either a side business or running it full time, like, you know, one of the best parts about running your own business is that you get to say no, you get to decide. And I don't think enough people realize that they're able to, 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 to seize like control over that. And that's like, you know, why else, why else like really run your own thing if you can't really decide, you know, exactly what you want to work on. So super important advice. Um, Mel, thank you so much for joining us. This was a really Great. awesome conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, we are, well, two, two little things here to wrap us up. First is um, we're going to be back with an episode, next episode of the Leap in about two weeks from now. Next week I'm on vacation, so uh, I won't be on my phone, allegedly. Um, and then second little thing is, um, Mel, if people want to follow along or take a look at your work, where can they do that? Yeah, my website is melly, M-E-L-L-I-E-Y-A-P dot yap. So I've got a lot of my work there. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime with any questions or if you're looking for a content partner.
Amazing. Um, that's awesome. And uh, the last thing is that tomorrow we've got a new release um, update coming to the platform. So if you already have an account, come through, check it out. We got some scope builder updates. We've got uh, a bunch of really awesome things. Um, and uh, we are going to be rolling out a bunch of uh, larger features around invoicing payments. I'll leave it at that uh, later um, in August. So uh, stick around, follow along, and thank you so much for joining. Have a good night, everybody, and thanks again for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you later. Bye.